Bom dia. É, desculpa, o mau português é péssimo. É, é brasileiro também. So from now on, I better not make a mess of your language and turn into English. Uh, I know I, you got worried that the, the rest would have been in that messy uh, sort of uh, half Brazilian, half Portuguese uh, sort of uh, language. Um, well, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, for the fantastic days, the great initiative, and for the invitation. Especially for the invitation, because it takes courage to invite a philosopher uh, to a meeting like this. It is a sign of desperation. Uh, uh, it means that you know uh, the trouble is so big that oh my goodness we can even ask a philosopher uh, about uh, saying something about it. <laughs> so uh, I hope not to disappoint uh, uh, some of you, especially the ones who clapped. Uh, but um, the, uh, there is a distinction that I want to start with, and that distinction um, will be with us for uh, the next uh, few uh, slides. When you look into the future, uh, you can actually uh, talk about prediction or prevention. And I shall be talking about prevention, not because I want to take a negative step, but because it's way safer. Think about it. If you want to prevent something happening in the future, uh, there are a couple of scenarios. First, what you want to prevent does not happen. You get a credit. Two, what you want to prevent happens. You get a credit. Because you wanted to prevent it, and it happened in every way. But at least you were right in you know, thinking that it was going to happen. So uh, in terms of uh, playing it safe for the next 100 years, I want to prevent a couple of things happening, which will be the second half of my talk. The first half uh, will be um, setting up the uh, sort of uh, framework. And because I know that we all know, it will be rather quick. In fact, if uh, I speed up any faster, uh, the slides will look like a movie. Um, so. Uh, essentially, the future is where the past happens again with a shift. And it's the shift that is interesting, not all the stable things that will happen. Uh, and for a philosopher, of course, life will be absolutely the same. We will be born, we will leave, we will die, end of the story. But that's not what is interesting for us today. That is well known. It's the shift in all that process that is going to make a difference. And because we might actually get lost uh, in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, um, I will repeat this map. Uh, in a few moments, whenever I move forward. First of all, uh, just a few words about the information age. I know you know, so that will be the fastest moment. Then uh, time, how we are going to move towards hyperhistory. A few slides on that. Space, how are we moving towards infosphere? Again, that's the new environment. And then what happens to us in hyperhistory within the infosphere? And I shall introduce a concept called the fourth revolution. And finally, five challenges. What I would like to see prevented so that the next 100 years will not see disasters as we might actually uh, fear. So the information age first, well, this is iconic. I don't need to explain it. We've seen it a thousand times. It comes from Wikipedia. Every kid has seen it. More and more power. Uh, that's the processing power of our computers. Thank you so much. And this is how little it costs. Less and less, more and more power for less and less uh, pennies. Uh, the result is that uh, uh, we have, as we heard uh, several times uh, yesterday and today, something called the Internet of Things. It's not there yet, but it's getting there to the extent that, uh, no, it's been around for about 10 years now, but to the extent that uh, people think, well, you know what, all those things that you can see up there, those 50 billion in a few years of uh, interconnected objects, well, those will be talking to each other. And you know what, uh, they will be talking to each other so much that actually uh, they will be doing all the talking. So in the next hundred years, we will be the species that is to the anthropologist coming from Mars who wants to study communication on Earth negligible in terms of amount of stuff that he gets communicated to and fro. Of course, not in terms of significance, not in terms of meaning, not in terms of what really counts, at least for us, but in terms of sheer amount of data exchanged from A to B and from B to A, we will not be doing no, uh, the, the business. Those are um, data from Cisco which I borrowed from the last conference uh, uh, last week. And you can tell that uh, somewhere uh, over here, between 2003 and 2010, we passed the threshold when there were more connected things in the world than human beings. By the time we're 2020, and there's a, a short uh, visible horizon, there will be about seven uh, connected gadgets per person. And mind that that is everyone included, including all the millions of people who never made a telephone call in their life, which means that everybody in this room will have three, four times their number. Now, 
there will be about 7.6 uh, billion people, but about 50 billion uh, things connected. And all I mean, really mean is, is a printer talking to, no, say a 3D printer talking to uh, your um, uh, computer so that you can actually print that Lego that today you can already put online. Now, um, all this, and remember, those simple curves have generated a fourth curve. So power, cost, and number of things connected. And what you get, a lot of data. Again, that comes from Cisco, a uh, recent uh, conference. Uh, we were here. We will be here, and zettabyte is gazillion and gazillions and gazillions of stuff. Uh, it's just a lot. But what is, it is, is interesting, is that we generated most of, uh, of that, 90% in the last uh, two years. Now, this generates a number of headaches, which we will not discuss today, maybe the topic for another uh, meeting. There are more data generated in 2012 than in the past 5,000 years. So anyone who does not feel overwhelmed is not getting it. Because it is overwhelming. It is extraordinary. It is a revolution. It is something that we have never experienced before. And that's very reassuring, especially for my parents who think, oh my goodness, this is really changing fast, Luciano. Yes, it is. Now, with that uh, in mind, uh, what happens? Well, we have lots of problems. As I said, this is just an appetizer. I won't stop on this. Acquisition and storage, because all this big open data that we discuss about, and mind, most of the big data are not open at all, but when they are open, they come with a lot of travel. So it's not a free meal, which, of course, as we all know, never existed. Acquisition and storage, that's a headache. Usability, what is the point of having all those big data if you can't use them? Security and safety. Do I need to talk after previous uh, speaker about cybersecurity? Accessibility, because maybe they are there, maybe they are secure, maybe they are usable, but I can't have access to them. No good. And then analysis, analytics or uh, data science, because even if I have access, if I can't make any sense of them, there is no point. And actually, uh, together with the previous speaker, when I speak about big data in other contexts, I like to emphasize uh, small patterns. That's why we need the big data for the small patterns hidden there. But you need a lot of analytics. And of course, all this comes with constraints, so and ethics. And you know what is the last point here, because everything you do so far comes with a dollar attached. There is no free solution. So this is the world in which we live. And what has happened to us for our predicament, our condition? And as I said, we could spend hours discussing what I've said uh, so far. Time. Well, we used to think that uh, there was a, something called the end of history. We already heard this uh, yesterday. Not at all. So prehistory is actually a, a, no, a 101 uh, introduction to history textbook. It's not a time in the human life on this planet. It is an adverb. You live prehistorically if you live in a society at any time in the history of this planet which does not have ways of r registering and transmitting current information to future generations. Basically, a society which does not have ICT. Basically, a society which does not have a way of writing. Basically, a society which we haven't known for the past 6,000 years, because here and in China, we invented a way of writing. But there are still a couple of uh, villages in uh, uh, Brazil that live prehistorically. They have no way of recording and transmitting, not the present, to the future, apart from what's here. Now, once you move to something like uh, uh, the Egyptian, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the US Empire, all the empires, uh, they normally rely on ICT. They do because individual and social well-being is related to ICT. You need something to convey, for example, laws uh, around the country or to future generations. Why hyperhistory? Well, because that relation has become a dependence. It's not just that we are having a good uh, stuff thanks to ICTs, but we're actually sitting on it. And you might think, oh, that's a lot of philosophical uh, talking. Uh, not so much. You know, as a single test, uh, next click, that you live or you do not live in a hyper-historic society if your society can be put on its knees by a cyber attack. So those who live by the digit, they die by the digit. And if you have that, you know that your society is so dependent on the infrastructure that their society is actually vulnerable to a cyber attack. That's a simple test that divides society like Afghanistan, which is not hyperhistorical, from the UK, which is. Of course, uh, we live in Europe, and most of us live in a hyperhistorical context. Now, this transformation has meant that, of course, 
we're confused. There's novelty. Something needs to be done. And things like cyberculture, posthumanism, singularity, and all that science fiction has something good in it. What is it? What the evidence that we feel trouble, that we need to find a solution, that we want to understand something. Now, as I said, these are three uh, fancy, uh, in fact, not to be taken seriously, science fiction scenarios, but it does show that someone somewhere is scratching something that is hurting. So what do we really need is a philosophy of nature, as we heard before, uh, where nature, the, art the artifactual, and the culture get together, a philosophical anthropology, because that is you know, uh, something that we have lost in the past, and a political philosophy, and again, you no. Know, we did not agree on all this, but it's coherent with a panel that is adequate to our time. So that is as far as hyperhistory is concerned. What about space? Well, here is where the infosphere concept helps. We thought for 60 years that we were uh, creating machines that could cope with the environment. Wrong. What we really did was transform the environment so that stupid machines could work in it. Think of a normal industrial robot. You don't unleash an industrial robot in the environment and says, oh, please build me a car, just go and do it. What you do is you build a whole environment so that the stupid robot is successful in building a car within that environment. That is called an envelope by the engineers, and it's the 3D space within which an arm of a robot is successful in doing what it needs to do. So we've been enveloping the world around the simple facilities uh, provided by our CTs. They haven't become any smarter. The, the smartest thing that we have today is as smart as my grandmother's fridge. Zero. But my grandmother's fridge didn't leave uh, in the infosphere. My new fridge does, and that's why it looks so smart. So this is the world as we used to have. You, you see that Wikipedia written under it? It was for us. That's the same. And it still says Wikipedia, but not for us. You can't read it, I can't read it, and it's read by machines. So what is the idea here? Uh, let me illustrate it quite simply. Um, so this is where we live. It's a dishwasher. In other words, we build a whole environment so that the stupid little things can actually do the dishes. And do not try this at home. Yes, exactly. Oh, by the way, I, I hope we are on record and streaming. I'm the one who does the dishes. Huh? Uh, this is the fancy thing that we've been pursuing for 60 years, and it doesn't really quite work. Or I wish it were. Now, Christmas is around the corner, but this is what I want for Christmas. An arm that puts the dishes inside the machine so that the kitchen becomes another envelope, and I am not the interface there between the dirty dishes and the box. So, in what sense are we moving into that kind of context? This is grandma, and she used to walk into a computer. Her daughter all of a sudden had a computer in front of her, and her granddaughter, she's walking to the computer again. It's just that she doesn't know it. The computer is around her. She lives in the infosphere. She never leaves the dishwasher. So we speak now, thanks to Brussels and a, uh, a group of research that I chair there uh, for the European Commission, of the on-life world. And you can actually download our work there. It's uh, free. Um, uh, freely available, it's called the On Life Manifesto, where some of the things I've said are described. It is On Life world is silly, it's so 90s, as my students would say, uh, to ask, are you online or offline? Uh, you must be someone who used to have a modem at home. Yes, <laughs> sorry, uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, it shows that I'm 51. Uh, no, no, today I'm much cooler and says, oh, come on, we we'll all live on life. We are the amphibian generation that is uh, enjoying or no, suffering from the transportation of our life from the analog to the digital. So what about us and our human nature? What happens in, in the hyperhistory and in the infosphere about us? Well, here is a local hero for someone uh, from Italy, uh, Galileo, and I just read the, the top because uh, you can read it pretty well, uh, put it in uh, large letters. The book of nature is written in mathematical language. I say, okay, fine, that's a good idea, that's cool. I uh, know, 17th century, uh, the guy was smart. And there's something to be said about that book of nature written in mathematical language. So what is coding? What is AI? What is all this ICT? And, well, AI does not describe the world, it doesn't tell you how the world uh, works, but it does not tell you how the world should work, it doesn't prescribe the world. So what does it do? And thanks to English, because this would be very difficult in any other language I know, it inscribes the world, and that's where philosophers play with words, but I hope you get the concept. He basically writes a new chapter in the Book of Nature. The Book of Nature is written in mathematical symbols, and there you go. We are adding chapters to that Book of Nature, in Galileo's Book of Nature. 
And this adding a chapter in the book of nature has shifted how we read it and how we read ourselves. So here is the fourth revolution that I anticipated. We used to feel that we were at the center of that beautiful book. We were the star of the story. And then Copernicus came and says, you know what, no, you, you, you're not. Uh, you are in the background. Uh, and that was unpleasant, but we had a second trench. Uh, we could still think that the book was the biological book, and we were the star of the biological book. And then Darwin came and says, I'm sorry, you're not at the center of that book either. So, oh, that's uh, doubly unpleasant, uh, but at least we had one more book to rely on with a centrality in our mental life. And then Freud came and says, well, sorry, uh, bad luck. Uh, uh, you really have to retrench. And then we've been retrenching in terms of our self-understanding, how important we are in the world, are we really so unique? Until then, uh, Turing came and uh, explained to us that we are informational organisms. And like informational organisms, we interact with all these other gadgets and things, those 50 billion things that will be living with us in the infosphere, in a hyper-historical society, et cetera, et cetera, for the next 100 years. Uh, and now with that interaction, we are a little bit upset because we have been pushed forward. So, Coming to the uh, final step in my talk, what is all this about? What's in it for me, the person who is like uh, Nigel's uh, grandchildren, going to live in this next hundred years? Well, there is one thing that is not a challenge. Thank goodness. And I spent just one moment on this because I think it's distracting. So I used to think that this was a joke. Um, singularity and other crazy people around, you know, tin hat people who will t tell you that the AI is taking over, you will be dominated by some Terminator. Yes, I mean, I'm sure that sells book, I'm sure you can get profiled in some newspapers, I'm sure that there's a successful move in your career, but that's Hollywood. There's not any shred of evidence that we are even close to that in any lab. Why I'm upset about this, because I used to think it was a great joke, but the truth is that it's distracting and therefore irresponsible, because we do have problems. We do have issues that are pressing. And just because you are smart enough to make sure that I'm looking at a horse and you're looking at a mule, and you present the mule like a horse and I'm confused, well, it doesn't mean, therefore, that there are no real problems affecting the horse. So let's talk about the real uh, issues, not the fanciful issues. What are the real challenges? And you know there are going to be five. Make the infosphere environmentally friendly. We're building these fantastic technologies at a cost. The dark side of that picture, the bottom line, is how much bad ICT is for the environment. The green light at the top is how good it is for the environment. So basically what we're doing right now is to use ICTs to save the planet in the same way as we say someone affected by cancer with chemotherapy. We hope to kill the cancer before we kill the patient. But that's the cost, that's the, the gambit that we're running here. And I would like to see politicians knowing exactly what they're doing. Not like starry eyed, oh, ICT is wonderful for the environment. Not so much. Remember the analogy. It's almost killing the environment. I mean, when you feel that heat on your legs because of your laptop, the energy is coming from somewhere. And it's not free. So remember the dark little bit at the bottom of this picture. And let's make sure that our infosphere is environmentally friendly. So far, so good. But maybe we should accelerate a little bit better. Make the infosphere human friendly. In what way? Here, a great quotation from a great guy from my country. We shape our building day after they shape us. Yes, that's the thought, exactly. We shape the infosphere. And if we build it wrongly, it will shape us. In what sense? It was a more fancy philosophical talk. Now, here are some data about smart cities. And that's the number of people who will be living, urban population, and percent of the urban population will be basically be living in great, immense cities for the next hundred years, and probably more. We're building them as we speak. Their foundations are weak. We're not taking care of the security, of the safety, of the efficiency, the logistics. Let's uh, uh, think about that more carefully. Remember prevention. And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't happen, so much the better. Make stupidity work for intelligence, not vice versa. Now, this is the uh, American market, uh, the job of the uh, um, market in the States. And you don't have to read anything else. Just look at the curve and look at the next curve. This is how polarized the jobs will be if you start thinking in terms of computerization of the job market. Now, that curve will affect an enormous amount of people. Are we really making sure that you know, all the social and political safe nets uh, are there? Are we taking care 
of our less privileged uh, citizens? Or are we simply thinking, oh, the market will take care of itself? Well, this is, and I told you, two curves, and one almost the opposite of the other. This is a classic Gaussian, and that's the intelligence in the human race. And of course, we all hope to be here, but most of us are here, and unfortunately, you know, hard to tell, believe, but you know, there are also people on the left-hand side, the silly guys. Now, that curve will not go anywhere. Unfortunately, technology is pushing the boundary of the jobs required further and further to the right. To be a webmaster today is not as trivial as to you know, go and maybe uh, do something with your hands in a car industry, uh, which was uh, also a little bit more demanding than doing something in agriculture. So we're pushing the boundary. We're not taking care of that uh, yet. Let's make sure that we do. And four and five, and I'm looking at the moderator uh, who's been very patient with me. Number four, make predictability work for freedom. We are rational agents to a large extent. You go back and you bought exactly the same toothpaste again and again. Because that's the toothpaste you like, that's the price you like, that's the toothpaste offered by the supermarket, and your computer knows that. And you come back home and says, Luciano, did you buy the toothpaste? Such and such. Says, oh, how do you know? What does it mean to, work, um, to make predictability work for freedom? It means that things like this won't happen. This is a classic, it's the economist, it's something that you know, everyone has seen. So I know you know, I'll be quick. 2012, that's no, middle age for ICT. Uh, Target, great chain, had 25 products that would allow to determine, look at the bottom, estimate her due date and send coupons time to specific stages of her pregnancy. That's how predictable we can become. Now, unfortunately, that was a mistake. They sent the coupons and the lady had not informed the family. Now, luckily, there was not a context where she was being stoned to death, but she could have uh, had, had the, the context wrong. The father complained and said, what? And he called test, sorry, um, Target, and Target said, well, look, according to our database, she is. And said, oh, it's impossible. She hadn't told me. Well, why don't you speak to your uh, daughter? And he went back and says, sorry, Dad, I was going to tell you. Uh, so that's not the way you should know about you know, the pregnancy uh, of your daughter, uh, but that's how predictability should work for us, not vice versa. And it becomes more serious as a sort of minority report. Again, this is, i like to show you old news in case there are new news. Since 2008, we've been using so-called predictive pol policing uh, to determine where to put our uh, forces and prevent crime. And look how successful it is. So the effectiveness is huge. The trouble is that, of course, with any advantage, some costs arise. Where you put your police forces, it means also that you are not able to use the same police forces elsewhere. So these are problems that we will see uh, happening again and again. And number five. Let's make technology make us more human. Not like this. Not something that we think is uh, no, a, a cool to be a cyborg. And uh, we heard before, we are social animals. That's why social media are taking care of that. It's like giving uh, sweets to kids uh, who are uh, uh, obese. Uh, that's, we should be a little bit more careful. As social animals, we get addicted to socializing. And as uh, animals who love technology, we might be addicted to technology itself. So maybe we should be a little bit more careful about that. And to conclude, therefore, I think the answer to my original question is that, yes, we are. We are special. But we are special because we are nature's beautiful glitch. We shouldn't be here. If we are objective and we look at the history of the universe, we're really the oddball. We are the outlier. And for a long time, remember the four revolutions, we thought, oh, we're so cool. No, we're diverse, we're different, but because we are special. And you know what? Well, actually, no. We're special in a sort of negative, beautiful way. We are a beautiful mistake. Nature made this mistake. We accidentally survived, despite all our efforts to kill each other too, you know, for a long time, and we might not be succeed uh, in the future if some atomic bomb gets exploded and so on. But as a glitch, we're very fragile. So we better be careful about what we do with this glitch for the next 100 years. So for the next 100 years, here are my recommendations to Nigel's uh, grandchildren. Think deeper, because uh, we're not doing it. We're rushing it, and we're rushing it every day. Design better, because that's, that's the future. And people who will design our world will be the ones who will determine how future generations uh, will enjoy it or not. And above all, be mindful a lot very mindful, because the problems for the next 100 years will be mainly, essentially, fundamentally ethical. Thank you.